Well, good afternoon. Welcome to another daily devotion. It's great to be able to pause in the afternoon, open up God's Word, and see what He has to say. A very warm welcome to you. It's great to have you with me again. And if you're tuning in for the first time, it's great to have you with us. We're just working our way through the back end of the New Testament. We find ourselves in the book of Revelation. So we're going to be turning to Revelation chapter 1. Well, chapter 1 for the last time at least, but Revelation chapter 1. But before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your word, which is so rich and true and pure. And We pray that you'd use it to bless us, to encourage us, and to build us up. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 20, the last section of this chapter. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Well, yesterday we looked at the vision. We looked at the the incredible image of Christ that John saw. John had the vision and he was confronted by Jesus. You remember he heard the words of Jesus speaking to him and he turned around and there was this incredibly glorious figure of the Son of Man, of Jesus Christ. And and we got sort of the, the detailed breakdown of what Jesus looked like, of what John saw. And in this section, we we get to see what happened to John. What happened to John when he saw this thing? And of course, John tells us straight away that he, he falls down like a dead man in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, it, it's important for us to recognize that he doesn't fall down in worship. Now, it's, it's not that John doesn't worship. We get other areas in Revelation where John worships. But here, John doesn't fall down in worship. It's not that he falls on his face and, and in, in praise to this Son of Man. He's not like Mary. You remember Mary when she stumbles across Jesus in the garden and she falls at his feet and lays hold of his feet and, and she worships him? This is not like that. This is more like the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul is confronted by Jesus, you remember the scene, the light comes down and Paul is just terrified. And who are you, Lord? And he's terrified. He's scared. Or Isaiah, woe is me. Or Daniel, who falls down like a dead man. In fact, Daniel has it about two or three times where he's utterly terrified by what he sees and what he hears. And so John here falls down in the same way he fell down at the transfiguration. In in Matthew's recording of the transfiguration, John, one of the apostles who was there, the apostles fall down on their faces, terrified, Matthew records. And so here, John falls upon his face, utterly terrified. And and just as an an aside, this is is one of the, the strong evidences that all of these movies and books about people who see Jesus are just all baloney. If you don't know what baloney is, they're, they're rubbish, they're fake. How do we know that? Because biblically, every single time someone is confronted by Christ, they fall flat on their face, they're terrified. In fact, it's so overwhelming to see into glory, to see the exalted, exalted Christ is so overwhelming that Paul says, I can't even tell you what I saw. I, can't, I cannot even tell you what I saw. 
and yet in these books and movies, like these seven and eight and 12 year old kids manage to go to heaven and, and see glory and come back and tell this lovely story about walking with, through the flowers and seeing all their friends and family. It just, it just doesn't match up to the biblical witness, but that, that's just, just an aside. I'll just throw that out there. We'll leave that to the side. But notice, notice that the one who has spent three years with Jesus, he spent three years with Jesus, walking, sleeping, eating, talking, is now confronted with Christ and lies like a dead man at his feet as he sees who Jesus really is. As he sees who Jesus really is. But notice, notice the wonderful comfort that Jesus gives him. Just, it just, it's just so encouraging. Verse 18. Sorry, verse 17. He laid his right hand on me. Now, the, the right hand... The right hand is, is the picture of blessing. You use your right hand to bless. You use the right hand to greet. You use the right hand to commission someone. When you greet a person, you, you shake with your right hand. When you bless them, you lay your right hand upon them. That's just the biblical picture. You extend the right hand of fellowship. And so Jesus comes with his right hand and he lays it upon John. And he says to him those words which, which John heard many times when he was on earth with Jesus. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Oh, how, how we need to hear those words. Isn't that true? Don't you need to hear those words? Do not be afraid. They're words that, that just ring out through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament over and over and over again. The Lord comes to his people and he says, do not be afraid. He said it to Joshua when he saw the angel. He said it to Isaiah when he saw God. He said it to Ezekiel. He said it to Daniel. He said it just to everyone. Because God, God doesn't come to terrify us. Jesus doesn't appear to John to make John afraid. He comes to bring him hope. He comes to give him courage. He comes to comfort John. And so that's what John receives. He receives the comfort. But, but why, why does he not need to be afraid? Why should John not be afraid? And, and Jesus tells him, Jesus says, fear not. And, and he gives this handful of reasons. He says, fear not, I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am from eternity to eternity. I live, I exist forever. And so there's nothing you need to be afraid of because I'm everywhere. I've seen it all. There's nothing outside of my control. And he says... I'm the first and the last, and the living one. Now, now to you and I, that maybe doesn't have a huge amount of impact. But do you remember John saw Jesus die? John saw Jesus die. And now John sees the ascended Christ in his glory. And, and in a sense, Jesus confirms that this indeed is the same one, the one who who died, and he goes on to say, doesn't he? He says, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, or I am alive forever and ever, and ever and ever and ever, from eternity to eternity. And so what, what Jesus is, is confirming for John is that this is the same Jesus that they shared a boat with. This is the same Jesus that ate bread with them and ate fish with them. And now they're seeing him, John seeing him in his exalted glory. And John needs to know that this same Jesus who died and was raised from the dead is the same one who's offering him comfort. Comfort comes from the same Christ that walked the earth. It is not a different Christ. Oh, he looks very different in his exalted glory, but it is the same Christ. And you and I need to know that, don't we? We need to know that the same Jesus that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the same Jesus who sits on the throne, is the same Jesus who will return to take us to be with him. 
But then notice also that he has the keys of death and Hades. Now, death and Hades, the keys of death and Hades here is is not the picture of of torment. Like there is the reality of torment in Revelation and, and the people who undergo eternal punishment but but jesus is more speaking about those who die and who go to death and and the fact that he has the keys to open that up and let them out in other words john i'm the one i'm the one who can let all the dead people out because i've conquered death you see jesus has conquered death and and you've got loved ones you have loved ones who have died. And and maybe you yourself are getting closer to death. Maybe you're in your 70s or 60s or 80s and you're thinking, man, I don't have that many years left. You can be comforted by the fact that Jesus has the keys to death and he will let free. He will let free all of his own. He will let you free. And then... Having given him this this great comfort, he commissions him again. He says, write. Write, therefore. Write what you have seen. Write what you saw. Oh, write what you saw. What The things that are and the things that are to come. The ESV translates this a little bit confusingly. It says, if you have a look at verse 19, write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place. And... and it's it's not it's not clear whether the translators may, are trying to help us see that. So let me say this again: Jesus could be saying, "Write what you saw back then, write what you see now, and write what you see later," which is one way you could interpret this and in how they've translated it. But it's it's I think it's more clearly meant that write what you saw, and and the explanation of what you saw was the things that are and the things that are to come. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you've, you're see, you've seen things and you're going to see things, and I want, you to, I want you to write them all down so that everyone knows what is happening right now and what is going to continue to happen into the future. Because this, this vision is not just a right now phenomenon. Some people have interpreted the whole of Book of Revelation as just a time of John reality. And some have interpreted it as only a future reality. And what Jesus is saying to John is, this is a reality for John and the seven churches, and it's also a reality for the 21st century. And it's a reality which is going to keep going until Christ returns. And he reinforces that with this explanation. This explanation of who he's writing to. He says, the mystery of the seven stars and the seven lampstands, the seven lampstands of the churches, those seven churches that he's going to write to, but also all the churches, and the seven stars are the angels of the churches. And you go, wait a second, what's the angels of the churches? Well, to be honest, no one really knows what what Jesus meant by angels, what John was trying to say. There's sort of one of three options. It's either a guardian angel, which is unlikely, because nowhere else in the scripture do we hear about churches having specific guardian angels. So it's either a guardian angel, or it could be like the the pastor or the minister or the ruling elder or the main sort of figure person of the church. But the problem is the word mainly for angel here pretty much always gets used as angel in the book of Revelation. Or the third option is it's talking about the spirit or ethos of the church. Well, And the reality is we don't know. But the point is, Jesus holds these seven stars. Jesus holds the reality of who these churches are in his hands. And he is busy walking amongst the churches. And what, what Jesus is doing even now in this section here, is introducing what he's about to do. And in chapters 2 and 3, we're going to see Jesus writing, or Jesus speaking, dictating a message, and John writing down the letters to the churches. 
And, and this, in a sense, segues into that. You see this glorious image of Christ amongst the churches of Christ. And you see him command John to write down everything he's about to say and, and everything John's about to see. And then we launch into that. And the thing is, we need to have at the back of our mind, just in closing, as we as we head into these letters, the thing we have to keep in the back of our mind at all times is we hear some pretty hard condemnations. What we need to keep in the back of our mind is, is that all of this comes from this glorious, comforting Messiah. And he doesn't come to the churches in order to crush them, but he comes to the churches. He comes to you and he comes to me in order to offer comfort. So, so as you hear really hard news in the word, as you open up the word and it, and it strikes you hard, because sometimes the word does that, you need to know that that's Jesus Christ bringing comfort. He's seeking to comfort you. He is the one who comforts. And he brings his word sometimes like a sword because he loves us and he's purchased us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the great comforter, that you comforted John, even in a state of terror and fear, that you are the first and the last, that you are alive forevermore, and that death will never conquer us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me again on this beautiful Friday. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the last daily devotion of the week. And then we're off to the Lord's Day. And praise the Lord, we get to finally in Auckland go back to church again. And look forward to doing that on Sunday. But have a great afternoon. God bless.